if you had one question to ask uh, Ralph, uh, what would it be? What makes you happiest? Uh, in life. <clears throat> What's your verb? If you can have it, a subcomponent there. Uh, I would say, um, in general, I don't. I didn't, get, I didn't get to be Ralph Baker on my own. I had a lot of help. Um, other than my parents, I mean, uh, there was some coach in the community or some guidance counselor or some teacher who helped me get to where I am. And I owe a lot of people. I think the one way to repay that debt is to um, help mentor other people. I owe, I owe a lot of people, and that's the only way I can repay that debt. And um, so I'm, I feel obligated in a lot of ways to um, take, I didn't just go to college just to go to college and make money for myself, but to um, also give back to the community. And, and for the next generation. And so if you could ask uh, Alex to come and coach your kids on, on one, one thing, what would it be? I would say discipline. I think um, a theme between all three of these talks was um, the opera singer, how she broke down, like, you know, how to breathe properly when you're, when you're singing. Um, there's a science to basketball. There's a science to um, also investing. And you can break it down. Like if you become good at these three or four concepts, you can become good at basketball. You can become good at investing. And also, the way he broke um, each hour of the day down into segments. Um, that was a unique way to live your life. You broke your. If you broke each hour of the day down into segments, and you said, "This is what I'm about," each hour, I think that would make a you know, very good life. So I, I think you know, in terms of how you came about. Um, being more disciplined about living, things that we may take for granted. Um, I was curious how you sort of made that epiphany. Do you want to take that? Okay. okay. Um, I mean, are, are you, is your family, have they picked up on that as well? Yes. And uh, not only my family, my, the, the team, I have the fortune to convene and facilitate. So, um, because what makes me happiest is not to know. I keep asking questions, you see. So at home, uh, my youngest daughter, when she was six, said, Dad, what would you like us to do with your body when you die? You know, that was a very important moment, I would say. Yeah? But I didn't hear her completely. I used that as a teachable moment. I'm a professor. So I was more in professorial mode, say, hey, thank you for asking the question. It's a very good one. I would like to donate my organs, be cremated, and for you and your sister, uh, to spread my ashes in the places where we had the greatest amount of fun. Six-year-old says, what? Don what's that donate organ? So I used that as an opportunity to talk about organ donation and to figure out where they had the greatest uh, uh, memories with me. But then what hit me after that was something that you explained beautifully tonight, is that our kids are farther ahead from us. They deserve a lot of respect. So I started to be tuned with my kids, and one day they said, Dad, don't nag us. I was their homework buddy. I said, but how, how, how come? I was nagging them. So I invited them to give me feedback and to, and to help me be a better father. And what I learned from them was amazing. And they still do it. So... Um, so I don't think there was a specific moment of, of epiphany. It was something that somehow was converging from multiple places. And then my own experience as a patient, I think, was what tipped me over and, and enabled me to put all these things together in a way that was pretty serious. And, um, and from which I have learned so much. So I hope that addresses yeah, yeah. somehow your... Yeah. Question. Let's uh, let's turn it over to the audience. I'm sure you guys have a number of questions. I'll, if you could please restrict it to one question that you ask, um, and then we'll try to turn it over uh, to both panelists as well. Um, Alex, this question is for you. More, um, a lot of it was talking about preparing for death, but sometimes you're not told that you're going to die, and so most people are not ready for it. So, what advice would you have for? for that kind of situation? Yeah, it, it's not easy. It's not easy because um, we are designed to deny it. And there are some scientists who believe that, in fact, we are the only species 
who have managed to do these things and organize events like this with machines like this and to ask questions like this precisely because our denial of our death have allowed us to go beyond what we would do if we were fully aware of our mortality. Because right? other species are aware of their existence. Chimps know that they are an entity. Uh, orcas, dolphins, most of the big apes know, and there is a test called the mirror test. So people put like a red dot on the ear of an animal and put them in front of a mirror. And, and, and several species start doing this, okay? Or trying to take the, the, the dog. Dogs cannot do that, okay? which is surprising because we think they are more aware than the others. So denial of death has had, according to evolutionary psychologists, an advantage for us. So we are built to believe that we are immortal, to be able to strive and to be able to, to do the things that make us unique. So it's very difficult to overcome, to overcome that. So what I've realized is that you need a big shock to your system like the one I had to do it. And, uh, but when it happens, it's usually too late. I've had patients, I say, what's your verb to travel? And they probably have two days to live. And I regret that I didn't do it. Yeah? So I was, or I've been very frequently, the first person who ever asked the, per the dying person what made them happiest. That's why I asked it to you and to everybody here. Because I don't want it to happen right to the end. So in most cases, it's impossible for us. Yeah? So that's what I've been trying to search. Is it possible to do it at this stage when it is theoretical? You're not facing a crisis. You're not devoting all your energies to being alive. Is it possible? And this kind of exercise with the inner voice and trying to motivate you to think about your own mortality when it's almost a game. That is serious, but again, nevertheless, at least would enable you to align yourself now in such a way that if it finds, death finds you now, you are, you are ready because you have learned how to live. So rather than thinking about how to die well, the objective is to learn how to live well, such a way that when death comes, you are fine. But not try to overcome our denial, which is very difficult under these circumstances. Ralph, if you had one piece of advice, what would it be? In terms of? To give to, to people generally. Uh, I would say um, that, um, for the, I mean, in terms of financial literacy, I think it's, it's, it's important to reach kids while they're young because they're not intimidated by it. But it's, and I think if your first touch point with financial literacy is when you're in your 20s or 30s, you're going to just say forget it because you're just going to be intimidated. But it's not too late. You still can learn. I think it's, um, it's very important. Um, the dichotomy with sports and financial literacy is that, uh, at least in the States, we put a high level of importance on sports or basketball, but it's really not that important, where we don't put enough emphasis on financial literacy, and it's extremely important. And it's not too late to learn. Um, and you know, I'm not saying don't be intimidated by it, but it's something that, um, that you can't overcome, and, you, and there are tools out there to help you. Um, overcome it, but it's it's not going to be easy. Uh, it's just that with kids, it's something, it's something new, and you know they, they're not afraid to fail. I mean, you go. I took my son skiing for the first time a while ago. He's racing down the mountain, and I'm like being real careful. Like, dude, why? You know, you know, you can hurt yourself, but uh, it's never it's never too late to learn this type of stuff. And I think it's uh, it's very important. That that's actually interesting. This idea, just to, I won't go on about it, but this idea that we're too afraid to fail. Uh, and it seems to me that as we get older and, and older, we, we stop, I mean, discovering or, or living or pushing ourselves, um, which, which is interesting. I mean, it, I, there's obviously value in getting kids to learn these things young when they're still malleable. They're willing to fail. They're willing to take these chances. But then there's the other, the flip side of it, which is we should also be teaching adults not to be afraid to, to fail in that sense. I mean, that's almost to an extent what, what you're arguing as well, why these kids succeed is because they're not afraid. We should also push that up. Right, and they're also not afraid to try anything, try something new. When I was a kid, my, my grandmother, uh, one of her favorite shows was a show called Mutual of Omaha. I'm not sure if you ever heard of it, but it was like, and they always show these denture commercials. <laughs> during the, um, I could never figure out why. They only show denture commercials doing um, poly grip and all that type of stuff doing the, um, doing um, Mutual of Omaha. And then some of the other shows for kids, they'd always show these, new exciting detergents 
like, you know, for teen, when teen, shows teenagers were watching or shows kids were watching, it would always be something new or something, some new cereal or whatever, but they would never show it for shows for adults because they know, advertisers know that adults are set in their ways. If you bought cheer detergent or Tide detergent for the past 20 years, you're not going to change. Where a kid who doesn't have any preconceived notions, they may try some new detergent. They may try something new. And so the advertisers even pick up on that as well. Which is, again, it goes back to Alex's point about living one hour at a time, something, make, make that hour into something, uh, something you can, rather than expecting it'll be like all the others. Um, next uh, question. Uh, let's take somebody at the front. A uh, question for Ralph. Uh, did, the ki did your kids uh, spot any trends before the Great Reche Recession in 2008 uh, that uh, could tell, that helped them predict that, this, that there would be a Great Recession? Right. Uh, one thing I didn't touch on um, during the presentation was that we, ta we ta talked about uh, bottoms-up analysis, um, price-to-earnings ratio, earnings growth rate. We also talked about showed them a, a top-down analysis where um, I told the kids that there was things that would affect the stock market and Apple and GameStop that weren't necessarily germane to Apple and GameStop. For instance, the economy. If the economy turns down, the whole market would turn down. So Apple and GameStop may be great companies, may be great investments, but if the market's going down, the stock, those stocks will also go down. So we looked at these big ticket items like auto sales and housing starts that drive the economy. And those big ticket items, if you track those two items, there are probably a, you know, a few hundred others, but if you track those two big ticket items, you can pretty much track gross domestic product. And uh, we looked at it at a cursory level. We weren't trying to predict anything, just trying to show the kids, just be exhausted. Like, this is a bottoms up analysis. This is a top down analysis. And over time, when we kept going to the meetings, uh, you know, we're looking at these charts of these housing starts and auto sales, and these things are getting worse. And then the meetings kept going on over time. We started noticing that these trends are falling off a cliff, and nobody's talking about it. And uh, initially, I would just blog about how the kids were doing on the court and how the uh, fund was doing, their stock picks were doing. And nobody was blogging about talking about this economy. Uh, and so I just started blogging about it. Uh, and I think that's how a lot of blogs get started. Somebody has a passion for something and picks up on something, nobody else, nobody else is talking about it. And uh, after Fanny failed and Freddie failed, and ultimately Lehman failed, the rest of the country woke up. But we, we were talking about it and blogging about it uh, before anybody else was talking about it. And that's sort of the thesis of the book, one, one of the themes of the book, that we were, through this investment process, we were teaching the kids that we picked up on something nobody else was talking about. And it was only through the New York Stock Exchange that I was doing this. I don't, I don't, I don't want to give anybody the impression that I go out and plot housing starts and auto sales um, in my spare time. But I was an economics major in undergrad, and the financial crisis was a bad thing. It's also a good thing in that it's brought economics back into the fold. Um, at one point, it was sort of considered a lost science. On Wall Street, all only thing people cared about were these quant jocks who could plot out, um, come up with these complex formulas to plot out um, home prices and that they were growing, rise in perpetuity or what have you. And nobody really cared about economics or economists. After the financial crisis, now you can open up um, the Wall Street Journal and you can see how this starts in. In, 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 in China or housing starts in India or auto sales or unemployment rates. So everybody's honed in on economics and they realize the importance of it. And people who have economics as part of their DNA or who can understand it and, or, and explain it are becoming increasingly important. So that's a good, good thing for people who have economics as part of their DNA. For a long time, um, people thought it was like a lost science. Alex, have you noticed any differences in your patients depending on the economic times? Uh, for example, a great recession in their frame of mind, the way they come in or the way they're willing to, to fight to continue to live, or, or do those things not matter once, you, uh, once you're faced with, with death? Yeah, uh, when I, and again, it's a privilege, uh, uh, um, become a companion for somebody who is aware of his or her mortality, what becomes important is what money cannot buy. And then you realize that money can only buy the cheap stuff. Yeah. And um, so money becomes practically irrelevant. Uh, at the same time, it, it is clear that when we are not aware of our mortality, 
or when um, we are still with the intense denial that makes us survive, um, we are accumulating reasons for regret. Most of the regrets <laughs> I see at the end, and, and I became a regret manager. And nobody taught me how to do that. I had to learn how to enable people to offload, to take a lot of the burden that had been uh, building through their lives. So a lot of the sources of regret that people experience at the end have to do with the overvaluing of money throughout life. And the fear that many people experience of not being able to satisfy their basic needs or pay the mortgage or help the kids go through school and that kind of things that seem to motivate most of us during most of the time when we are in the so-called productive age. And um, so the biggest change is that the economic crisis doesn't matter, really. In fact, a lot of people feel quite happy that it's happening because they wish other people could be aware of what they now understand, that we overvalue money and uh, undervalue what money cannot buy for is really where most of the important aspects of life are. Any questions from the back? Or, oh, yeah. There are a lot of indicators because of a large number of us people that uh, we may be, because of our large numbers, causing some extinction. I'd like to get uh, input for each one of you two on how, what actions we could take so that does not happen. That what doesn't happen, excuse me? Extinction. No, it's going to happen. And uh, there is no dominant species in the history of the planet that we, about which we know that hasn't disappeared. So it may take us five months, five years, 50, 500, or 5,000 years. Um, we are going to disappear as a species. And now there are two lines of thought, just for very, very uh, um, explanatory purposes. There is, a, there is a spectrum that has a group that we could call the apocalyptics. People who think that we are not going to see the end of the 21st century because of pandemics or because of nuclear war or because of um, uh, violence in different, in different ways or because of our chronic conditions and chronic diseases. Those are the apocalyptics. But even those who appear very optimistic, and they are called the transhumanists, they believe that by the middle of this century, we will be able to download our brains into avatars and that this form that we have now is just an evolutionary step towards the post-human. So when you look at the two extremes, and we may be the first generation in the history of the species that can look at both extremes as possible. There is no human species as we know it now beyond that. So when you look at the two extremes, so it may be closer than we think. <clears throat> there may be an intermediate step. There may be a way for us to, to maintain and protect what we value as, 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 as human. But the outlook for us in this form, in this fleshy, bony form, doesn't look very good. I mean, I guess on, on that point, um, his concept of, um, you know, this chase, you know, chasing of money or uh, my concept or my, you know, where I think it was money for, for money's sake, I think it, um, and, and in, in the short term it's going to may cause, um, at least in the States, some consternation in terms of how well the overall populace lives uh, because I think maybe uh, people at the grassroots level may not be able to explain the financial crisis or the economy in the way that we would in these sort of concepts, but they still feel it. And you know a lot of the um, the bailouts, and a lot of the um, the greed on um, in big business and on Wall Street that's happened, uh, the wanton speculation that's happened um, leading up to the crisis and after the crisis. I think that's a potential for social unrest um, going forward. And also, like things like um, like shale fracking, where you know if it's making money and it's potentially uh, generating jobs, but at what expense? At the expense of the environment. I don't live near um, any operation that's engaging in uh, shale fracking, but if you listen to um, some of the pundits on, on television or 
some of the politicians or some people in big business, it's like, you know, this energy push is what's really helping the United States um, in terms of um, creating jobs and also in terms of uh, our balance of payments and um, generating uh, gross domestic product, but at what expense? Yeah. I would um, like to build on that because um, according to some of the most serious scientists who study climate change and, and environmental, the environmental impact of humans, we may have crossed the no return line. Even if we stopped using oil now and we replace what you see, try to build nuclear plants or whatever, the process has already, you see, been initiated to, to disappear faster than would have been uh, the case otherwise. So, so we might be facing our death as experience, as a species. So just to bring back the analogy, using this as an opportunity because of your question, to the individual, we may be a species that needs palliative care. We may be a species that requires to start thinking about how to live as well as possible while we have the opportunity to do so by eliminating the sources of unnecessary suffering that we're experiencing now, like a billion people hungry. There is no reason. There is enough food for everybody. We need to relieve hunger. There are people with no roofs on, their, on top of their heads. There is plenty of space and plenty of materials and technologies to enable us to do that kind of things. So how can we start looking at what is causing suffering to try to eliminate it, understanding that our life as a species is going to be finite? And then there is another force that we tend not to recognize, and, and is the return of infections. The main cause of death for humans up to the middle of last century was infections. And then antibiotics came. And we physicians became gods and could make the difference between life and death and all that. But now these bugs have learned how to resist the antibiotics. And the fact that we have used these drugs a lot in animals is contributing to that. So now we are starting to contemplate within the world of medicine a post-antibiotic era where these bacteria are going to start killing us just as much as they did throughout most of our history and reduce our life expectancy and, 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 and wipe us out with the support of a lot of viruses that are brewing to give us pandemics. So that realization may be the wake-up call we need to start focusing on what is really important, which is usually what money cannot buy. I think uh, we'll wrap it up there on that uh, positive note. Go, go home, think about it. Um, try to come up with solutions. We'll need them. Um, I want to thank our, our, well, two, but our three speakers who were absolutely fan fantastic. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.